Welcome everybody to Sports Talk with Chris, the first official episode under the name Sports Talk with Chris. I'm Chris Verma alongside Marcus Trevetti, and we are starting this weekly deal specifically about college football for the rest of the season. So we have it from now late August all the way to the middle of January up to the national championship game. This is the week zero edition to the inaugural episode of it. So we're going to get go ahead and get straight to it first and foremost. If you're new to the channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Sports Talk with Krish on the road to 2,000 subscribers. If you want to check us out, Instagram or TikTok, we're at Sports Talk with Krish or uh, Twitter slash X, which is Krish Verma underscore three. And if you want to go check out Marcus MPT Sports, um, he's basically everywhere, Instagram, Twitter, everywhere to check out Marcus. But as as um, Triv, as you know, um, I'm a very big Florida State fan. I've already switched my gear because I know... Um, not a lot of people like Florida State, and a lot of people took yesterday as a parade after Florida State lost in Dublin in an upset to Georgia Tech by three points. We're going to talk about that game, Marcus. It was very, very disappointing for the FSU faithful. There were a lot of expectations coming off a 13-0 season before we don't talk about the bowl game that happened afterwards. Point is, very good season that ended the way we didn't want it to, getting snubbed from the postseason, and then starting the new year under DJU with a loss, an international loss, you could say. Yeah. Well, first off, I mean, this started this this loss for Florida State started well before the game even started. Uh, the college football AP poll committee absolutely screwed them by making them the number 10 seed. Florida State is not a top 10 team in college football, and they weren't going into this match, like, to be very frank with you. And it's pretty simple because DJU is not the quarterback that Jordan Travis was. And also, most of the players from For Florida State last year, guys like Trey Benson and Jordan Travis, who unfortunately with that knee injury is probably going to be sidelined for most of the most of his football career moving forward or probably not ever be be able to pick up a football again but besides the point they don't have the same roster they had last year so this is not as good of a team as it was last year so they should not have been a top 10 seed in my per first off and I think Georgia Tech winning this game pretty much diminished any hope for Florida State this year in the ACC which is a very weak division this year or weak conference this year I mean, definitely a weaker conference compared to last season. It was really ran by Florida State all of last year, but their team being so well, being ranked in the top four for most of the season, I see what you're saying. And it honestly, even more from just Jordan Travis um, being selected in the fifth round by the Jets, but Trey Benson going to the Cardinals, Keon Coleman, Johnny Wilson both leaving their two best receivers, Jaheim Bell leaving on the defensive side. You have Jared Verse uh, too. Yeah, Jared Verse, Braden Fisk, both going to the Rams, Renardo Green, all these guys leaving on both sides of the ball. The the biggest returner the Florida State had was Patrick Payton, who is now the leader of the defense. And I mean, still in general, we saw Haynes King and Jamal Haynes run all over Florida State this game. They might have only 24 points. Uh, does not tell the whole story for how this game sincerely won. Florida State could not get a stop on defense. Well, yeah, for sure. And also Patrick Payton was god-awful yesterday. I mean, he was just blown into proportion by Georgia Tech wide receivers. I mean, if you look at the stats yesterday from Georgia Tech wide receivers, uh, you got um, Jamal Haynes, who had 16 receiving yards, which is not much, but uh, he did have 75 rushing yards and two touchdowns. But as for receiving, I mean, you had Malik Ruff Rutherford with 66 yards and Chase Lane with 31 yards. I mean, Georgia Tech really mostly dominated on the rush game, but Haynes King still put up a solid performance with the 107 QBR. So, Well, so you've kind of made it sound very clear on what your thoughts are from this for the rest of the season, specifically for Florida State as well. Does this loss not only impact their hopes for the ACC championship? Because we already know that since it is a conference loss, that means this isn't this is this also counts towards conference play, which means Florida State is now at the bottom of the ACC for a week. So we're talking about a conference loss. Does this already ruin Florida State season before week one even begun? <laughs> yeah, week zero. Um, I'm gonna honestly have to say. It depends on how the rest of the season shakes out. I mean, obviously, they'll still make a bold game because they're still, like, a powerhouse team, and they're in a uh, top-five conference 
in uh, college football, and they're still one of the top teams in their conference, even though uh, they're not going to win it anymore. But as for making the college football playoff, honestly, no. But to make a bowl game or a decent bowl game, I mean, even though all the New Year's Six bowl games are now part of the college football playoff, I mean, yeah, probably, but there, no one's going to put them on their radars this year. Well, someone that did appear on the radar was Georgia Tech because this was a very uh, quality win, no matter how fraudulent we want to say Florida State is. If we look at it from Georgia Tech's, uh, Georgia Tech's perspective, this is a very big win. They have not beaten a top 10 team since they beat Florida State about nearly a decade ago and that uh, where they blocked the field goal and ran it back for yeah. a touchdown. And they were showing so, that on the telecast today, too. And that's, yeah, that was what, that was the Jimbo Fisher era. So it's been this long before Georgia Tech has made this type of noise and ironically against Florida State again. But what does this say for Georgia Tech? And we can, uh, I'll, I'll pull up their schedule here as well, because I was very curious after this win. They get this win against Florida State and their big matchups coming up for the rest of the year. They'll have Notre Dame. They'll get to host Notre Dame. And then their final three games, everything else is kind of solid. They'll have Georgia State, Syracuse, VMI, kind of an easy schedule until you get to the last few games of the year. You got Notre Dame, Virginia Tech, Miami, NC State, and then obviously their rivalry game, which will be at Georgia this year. So yeah, that... <laughs> I don't know how serious we can be about Georgia Tech for the playoffs. I think that's a little too much. But no, I must say – That's a far stretch. That is a very far stretch, but I must say for the ACC, how much noise do you think Georgia Tech could possibly make? As we know, it is a little bit of a weaker conference. Okay, and when I say weak, I'm saying compared to the other Power Four conferences. I mean, the ACC, ACC still has some solid squads. Maybe they sneak in two playoff teams, but I highly doubt it. In my opinion right now, it's really just Clemson's conference to lose. And as for Georgia Tech, uh, I mean... It means a lot, but at the same time, this game doesn't mean much. Like, this is still the first game of the year. This is week zero, as a matter of fact. It's not even the first official week of college football. And frankly, looking at their schedule, I can see them losing three to four games this year. They're probably going to lose. They're going to lose to Notre Dame and Georgia. I can assure you that. Uh, but I mean, pray on God's name that they ple- that my both my teams, Notre Dame and Georgia, beat Georgia Tech. But uh, I'm telling you right now, those are not going to be games that Georgia Tech is going to win, or at least it's going to be tough for them. And uh, I, I I, don't know if I could see them beating Miami. The one thing they have an advantage for them against Miami, though, is that it is in, uh, it is in Atlanta for that. So maybe Georgia Tech has an advantage there, but... I'm not 100% sure. I mean, Louisville's a tough squad, too. I mean, even in two weeks, once they face Syracuse, Syracuse is a good team this year, too. But, I mean, they they got an easy, they got a fairly, fairly easier schedule. I mean, like, Syracuse isn't a powerhouse by any means, but they really don't face any real contenders except Miami and Georgia Tech, so... But, yeah, as for Georgia Tech, for sure they're not going to make the college football playoffs. I think the highest they'll finish in the ACC this year is top four. Because, mind you, there's also teams like new teams like SMU as well that are going to be good this year as well. But And I don't, honestly, I don't even think Georgia Tech's going to finish above Florida State in the ACC this year. So. Yeah, I mean, maybe a little bit of worry for SMU as, I mean, they, they also had a week zero matchup and nearly lost to Nevada on the road if it were not for a late comeback. Preston Stone is a great quarterback, I must say. Yeah. But that, that that game on Saturday night did scare me a little bit for SMU. They, they came up with the win, so I cannot really say anything else from it. But SMU also has an incredibly weak schedule this year outside right. of Florida State, who we know are fakers now. I don't. I don't necessarily know about fakers. Those. I still think FSU is one of the best teams in the. It's not really a uh, an accomplishment to say you're the best team in the ACC, unless you're Clemson, who will probably make the postseason. But I, I still think Florida State. It's tough because now you before the season before this game, I looked at you look at Florida State on paper. You're like, okay, this is like a 5-0 and start before you get to Clemson. That might be a game that they're hosting Clemson, but that might be a game they lose. Then you got Miami, Notre Dame. Like, if I if I looked at this before the Georgia Tech game even happened, I would have probably said 10-2 and losses at Miami and Notre Dame as a normal guess. 
But like now that you have this loss against Georgia Tech, yes, it was an international game. Yes, it was week zero. So it was a week earlier than what players are prepared for. Yes, all these circumstances. But it still kind of takes away that hope and that feeling that what you thought this team was going to be already proved they were not in the first game of the season. And maybe DJU gets better as the season goes on, but I don't know how much time you can give somebody to progress during a 12 game season. And as even though maybe one loss does not ruin your season in college football anymore, it still means a lot. Yeah, well, for sure. One lo- you said it right there. One loss doesn't ruin your season. It, and yeah, it means a lot. That's pretty much the best way to sum it up. But here's the thing for Florida State. I can assure you they're not going to lose a game in Tallahassee this year. They will beat every team they face once when they're in Tallahassee. But I will say, I think they can pretty soundly defeat Duke. Duke's a weak squad this year. Uh, and then, as like I'm saying, strictly as their road games. But the other three, those raise some serious eyebrows. Notre Dame, I mean, now looking at the fact that they lost to Georgia Tech, uh, that's gonna ri- that's gonna be an extremely tough game to win. Uh, especially at nighttime in South Bend. That is going to be a hostile environment in the winter. Well, not the winter, but in November, which is cold enough. So, yeah, and Notre Dame's a scary team this year. That defense is ridiculous, and we saw how weak that FSU offense was yesterday. Like I said, SMU's a solid team. That could still be a game, though, that Florida State wins, and Miami's got a powerhouse offense this year, so it's going to be tough for them. And you know what? You said DJU might be, uh, like, he might progress over the season. I mean, I can even see a scenario where potentially DJU isn't the quarterback Mm -hmm. going down the road at the end of the season. Like, I mean, I don't know. There's no one really that great outside that's that can really challenge DJU yet at the quarterback position, but we'll have to see. I mean, you had a couple guys that stepped in uh, once Jordan Travis got injured. Like, I'm pretty sure Luke, Kruk, Luke Kromanuk and uh, – correct me if I'm saying his name wrong. Uh, uh, so he he's actually a freshman. Um, oh, he the is? Two oh, okay. last year were Tate Rodemaker and Brock Glenn. Uh, Rodemaker transferred to Southern Miss. is now the starter there. Brock Glenn was a true freshman. He was a third string last year. True no, I know, I know Brock Glenn's not with the yeah. team anymore. Yeah, so he no Brock Glenn's still with the team. Yeah. Oh, he is. Ro- he's, not, he's not transfer. shown on the Brock Glenn's not being shown up on the depth chart, at least on the one that I'm looking at. But yeah, okay. I thought there was like one guy that was a third stringer. I'm pretty sure. Like he didn't play, but he was. I yeah, so yeah, Rod- Rodemaker transferred out. Luke is actually a freshman that um, FSC recruited this year and is a true freshman this year. He's mm-hmm. projected to be the quarterback, honestly, by next year, since this is technically DJ's, DJU's last year of eligibility, I believe. I hope. I don't want him back next year, to be honest. But Yeah, no, I think I was talking about Brock Lunn. I thought there was somebody else, though, too, but I guess not. But yeah, was, was Luke, Luke Cronemaker could definitely be uh, – He, I, yeah, he could take that spot. I mean, I, I, it's even more unlikely nowadays with freshmen starting in college football, especially with the transfer portal now. But – and honestly, I could see Brock Glenn being more – like taking that spot more this year because, I mean, he did start games last year, and Brock, Brock Glenn was a starter for the Orange Bowl, right? He was a starter for the ACC championship too, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, those two. And then, I mean, obviously that ACC championship was an absolute oh snooze fest. <laughs> but uh, He just ran the ball with Toa Feely the entire game, yeah. which we should have, which I think Florida State should have done because they started off the game. The first score of the college football season was literally a Lawrence Toa Feely touchdown. Yeah, so I mean, like, Toa Feely did... was getting the ball a ton at the start of the game, but then they started giving and it to And then they just Del stopped. Williams. It's like, why would you stop that? He only had, Toa Feely um, had the uh, first touchdown and was playing great. And then you look at his stats, then Roydell Williams takes the rest of the game, and Toa Feely only finished with eight carries for 32 yards. It's like, why did you stop what you started with? And Florida State was always, no, at least even during the Jordan Travis era, was always known for their, their rushing attack. They had to, they had a dual threat quarterback. They had Trey Benson. They had Toa Feely. Now they have Roydale Williams as that running back too. And then they always like they, they ran jet sweeps, Keon Coleman, Johnny Wilson. It's like, 
why would they run away from that? And it was working to start the game. And then you bring out the DJU, the the vet you could call it, and that we've seen for the last few years in college football that is a very inconsistent, indecisive quarterback that was ranked very high, and he has the potential to be one of the best college quarterbacks and could have been one of the best NFL prospects, but never showed it because of his inconsistency. And it yeah, just well, was proven the entire game. That's the problem with DJU. I mean, especially when he was at Clemson. The main thing that rose eyebrows with him was the consistency. And then, I mean, eventually, along his way at Clemson, I mean, he was fine for most of the season last year at Oregon State uh, toward, until towards the end where he started falling apart. But, I mean, at Clemson, eventually, he got replaced by Cade Klubnik at some point in his last season. So, but yeah, DJU, I mean, I was confident about him being the Florida State starter. I thought they could stay as a top 25 team this year with him. Like, I mean, he's still a solid quarterback, but the other problem is Florida State just has absolutely no wide receiver depth and they have nowhere near as good of the talent at wide receivers they used to. Now, don't get me wrong. Their defense is still strong and their running, their rushing game is the best part of the team. But I think what Mike Norvell works with the best is a good wide receiver combo. So that way your quarterback can throw it out deep. And like you said, they loved running jet plays with Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson last year. So that's the main issue with Florida State. And as you saw in the game, they were so slow offensively the entire game. It was blah. It was honestly like watching last year's Panthers team. It was just there was no movement. There was always there's always screen passes. And then whenever the quarterback tried to step up in the pocket, it wasn't even the offensive line's fault. It's just the quarterback either nobody was open, which I can sort of believe looking back at a little bit of the game that nobody really created separation, which is why we're talking about the issues. He doesn't necessarily have a wide receiver one like Jordan Travis had specifically last season as well. He had two wide receiver ones, you could say, um, because their best wide receiver is what? Ja'Kai Douglas? So yeah, like, and, and he's not that good. Correct, and Ja'Kai Douglas was considered the wide receiver 3-4 last year. So like, Exactly. He barely got the ball last year, too. Yeah, it's just like you make that type of switch and you don't have a receiver. Like even uh, we, they had Winston Wright last year transfer to East Carolina. So like they yeah. have all the, even receivers are leaving. So like it's how do you keep the core that you had from last year? They lost all Johnny those guys. Wilson got injured last year too, right? Both of them. Uh, there was actually a game where both of them got hurt. It was a game against Pitt. That was the game where FSU only scored twenty four points. No, yeah, but, um, I remember. I remember that because that was like. That was that was like what? That wasn't earlier in the season, right? It was a li- actually it was a little later in the season. It was like oh, early. It was? it was a couple weeks before Travis got hurt, actually. Oh, but I'm they thinking were of the. I was thinking of the. Now. I was thinking of the Florida State Boston College game. No, that was that was Florida State was dominating that gaming, and uh, Castellanos just went off in like the third, fourth quarter. Like Florida yeah, State was no. like thirty-one to ten at one point. But even at the point where I mean, I think Johnny Wilson missed a little bit more time than Keon Coleman last year. But even yes, at the point did. when both when both of them were injured, Jakai Wilson was still just not getting the ball last year. So. Yeah. Yeah, and like I said, that's that was the problem with Florida State yesterday. Their their offense was just so slow. And, I mean, mainly, I mean, that's Mike Norvell's fault. But as much as it is Mike Norvell's fault, it's also DJ DJU's fault. I mean, he's got to get the offense to get going. Like, I get you're the new guy around campus, but you had a whole summer to work with them. And DJU was a transfer portal quarterback last year. He, I think he would know how to adjust his schemes quickly, but... He just looked so pitiful. I don't know if it was the jet lag or whatever, but I, I mean, mean, he just looked certainly, terrible. You cannot yesterday. blame the jet lag if the other team did the same thing. So, like, exactly. So, and against the Georgia Tech defense, who I guess is okay, but I mean, Florida State's going to face so many more better defenses this yeah. year. Like, even though they have a weaker schedule, like, how, how's DJU going to be able to complete a pass against Notre Dame's defense if he was barely able to do anything against Georgia Tech's defense? Like, that's my question. And you already saw the memes yesterday. He's a McDonald's worker now. <laughs> I saw the LinkedIn jerseys and everything. 
I, well, I just cannot the believe about SMU too. SMU has a strong defense, and so does North Carolina. We saw North Carolina's D line last year against uh, who? Who did they play? South Carolina in the first week. Yeah, or was that last year? I believe so. Like that, they were they were getting sacks after sacks last year. Yeah, Carolina's defense can be incons- inconsistent. I I do know what you mean though. But they still have a good D line, which is the main, which is the most important thing for a quarterback to not get sacked. Yeah, well, I, th- I think it was just funny looking at the stats. If you look at the first half, you're like, oh, DJU, um, eleven for 14, 96 passing yards at halftime. That doesn't look too bad. Then you see negative point one yard per passing attempt, and you're like, exactly. How is that even possible? His air, his air yards were the even worst part. <laughs> yeah, like how does that make any sense? Like, how is that pot? That that means he's literally screen passing everything. Everything is behind the line of scrimmage. And you know what's the sad thing is, is that like, you look at you look at his passing yards, nineteen for twenty seven, one hundred ninety three passing yards, and you're like, oh, so Florida State was definitely running the ball most of this game because that's how they got most of their touchdowns. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, they they did not have a lot of rushing yards. Their two main running backs, Roydell Williams and Lawrence Tofali, uh, combined for a total of seventy yards yesterday rushing. So, and I mean, the sadder part is that DJU didn't have one single passing touchdown yesterday. I'm I'm honestly shocked that they did go away with the run from Toa Feely and Williams because they um we we know first and foremost what Toa, Toa Feely is capable of. Last season when uh I believe Trey Benson had an okay game in the ACC Championship game, but it was Toa Feely that they would just like give him the ball and wildcat several times. They didn't trust Brock Glenn. They just gave Toa Feely the ball and he would get them like 60 70 yard gains that's how they got their chip shot field goals and got in the end zone once and it mm-hmm. maybe it was ugly but Toa Feely is the reason they won that game so it's it was very shocking to see then Toa Feely is now the full running back one he's the starter he's your guy he's your captain why um and they start the game off with him getting a touchdown moving the ball down it's just like I don't understand why they decided to go away from that. that that's like that's always like, been Norvell's identity at Florida State is the run game. Yeah, well, I did like Mike Norvell's of aggressive tempo though uh, to start the game when he uh, when they went for two after they scored their first touchdown. He and I Norvell this I I, I know the coach always gets point the finger at on loss in any anything in any sport. It's always uh, they always look at they always look at the player on the field, but like it's like oh it's the coach's fault they didn't prepare him well blah blah blah. Yeah, I, I don't I don't yeah. yeah. Other than Norvell going away from the run game, I honestly cannot say this loss was Norvell's fault. No, yeah, it wasn't. Cause I mean that that's like I said, as much as you want to say this was Mike Norvell's fault, this loss, most of it was on DJU and just the slow, slow, pathetic tempo of Florida State's offense. And what frankly kept them in the game, and I'm not even gonna, the defense kept them in the game, but at the at the end, the defense also kind of sold them too. But honestly, the most impactful piece for Florida State yesterday was Ryan Fitzgerald on the kicking. <laughs> it's like, hilarious he's to win think the about it. Award. He's winning an award that like Ryan Fitzgerald is the best kicker in college football, and they had the uh, oh, master sure, of the sure. punter. Yeah, so they have the best kicker and punter in college football, but that's beyond the point. That's not going to happen. 100%. But even so, it's college football, and we know how irrelevant kickers are in college football. So, Punters, I'm, but like, I mean, kickers <laughs> can be important. There's some bad kickers in college football that are on good teams. I have. I mean, yeah, you get I perfect have. example Georgia, Ohio State in the Peach Bowl in in uh, the college football playoff two years yeah, ago. Yeah, every Georgia every single the every single Alabama kicker, every single oh, 100%, one hundred percent. I don't know how, but every single one they get. As a matter of fact, every kicker that's not at the Big Ten. <laughs> yeah, true. I think Big Ten. Yeah, Big Ten kickers are the best. But we'll we'll but, move yeah. on from the Florida State game, and that was really the biggest topic for this episode. We're just yeah. gonna preview. Uh, a couple of the biggest matchups coming up in week one. First and foremost, a game that we all want to watch. I'll definitely be watching on my drive to Greenville for the ECU game. Clemson and Georgia from Mercedes-Benz Stadium, Atlanta. I'm very excited for this game. I, I think I have a feeling he's going to win. 
but I'm very excited for the entertainment and the quality of this game. Yeah, and one last thing that I have to say about the Georgia Tech game, I didn't really talk about much about Georgia Tech. Uh, their defense was stellar, but their offense uh, uh, played crucial points too. And as for Florida State's defense, they kind of ended up losing them the game as well. I mean, that big sack or and that miscellaneous on the fumble there from Georgia Tech when they were in field goal position. Georgia, uh, Florida State's defense should have taken advantage of that, and they should have prevented Georgia Tech from kicking a field goal and uh, honestly just taken control of the game or make, push them further back. But great win by Georgia Tech. But as for Clemson, Georgia, I just wanted to say a little bit more about that game because I'm just going to keep it sweet and short. I think the Georgia players are just going to start acting like J Jason Tatum. Like, what they going to say now? What they going to say now after this game? It it's that simple. There's nothing much to say about this. Uh, you know what? I, I, I'm not even going to specifically talk about the game. I mean, I get I'm wearing a Michigan sweatshirt. Uh, it's really just the only thing I could find in my closet right now. Not a fan of the team. Uh, I'm a Georgia, diehard Georgia, diehard Notre Dame fan. Uh, to keep this in simple terms... We're basically just reenacting what everybody said when, when everyone was saying, ooh, number 11 seed Oregon's going to give a good fight to Georgia and Atlanta for the first week of the game. What happened? What happened? What yeah. happened? That's all I'm going to say. That's literally all I'm going to say. Clemson's a good team. Yeah, but that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, Georgia is uh, notoriously in these type of week one match. Georgia and Bama are known for... If they get a good team week one, that's at a neutral side. I still remember the uh, USC Bama game when Jalen Hurts was the Bama quarterback from years back, and the way that USC ran onto the field like extra, extra pumped up, and they lost by like sixty points or something absurd. It was like just Georgia and Alabama are known for absolutely owning these type of games. But I am excited to see the progression. I hope what is progression from Cade Klubnik in the Clemson offense. I am just saying that. And then, yes, yeah. you're going to get the, the best thing to see from this is you get probably the best defense you can play for like the entire season in your very first game. So it is and a bit, I, I'm very excited to see it. Not even that for a guy like Cade Klubnik, who struggled at points in the season, especially with his accuracy last year. Uh, it's a good test because he's facing arguably the best, uh, arguably the best backfield in college football, led by the best defensive back in college football. Uh, screw Michigan. Uh, Malachi Starks on top. Yeah, Malachi Starks is a real, I mean, definitely projected first round pick, maybe even higher top 10. Ma Malachi Starks is a, a dog, but I must say someone else. If we want to talk more about offense, somebody that I really yeah, we want to We don't care about, we we don't care about Will Johnson. I get I'm wearing a Michigan sweatshirt, but we do not care about Will Johnson. Malachi I still Starks think Will Johnson might be the better core, but that's a different no, debate for another Malachi day. Malachi starts on top. That's a debate for another day. But we'll go to Miami, Florida, because I sincerely wanted Florida State to bring in Cam Ward instead of DJU, and I'm <laughs> being completely honest because I, uh, when we were going after, it was either Cam Ward or DJU. And I remember Cam Ward. A lot of people, some for some reason, don't remember this. I don't know if you do. Cam Ward, when he he was officially transferring out of Washington State, and then he declared for the NFL draft for a couple of days. I don't know if anyone remembers. He uh -huh. declared for the NFL that. draft for a couple that. of days, and then after FSU got DJU, he undeclared from the NFL draft and transferred to Miami, like their biggest rivals. And there I was like, has, are you and that serious? Says something. There has to be something said about Mike Norvell or something or how he's recruiting quarterbacks. He just, just did not want to go to Florida like, State because, like, yeah. they were recruiting both of them. They were going all in on Cam Ward at first. They really wanted Cam Ward. And then he declares for the NFL. It's like, oh, wait, all we have left is DJU. We'll just go. So they claim DJU. Then he just undeclares and, like, yeah, no. opens up well, recruitment and goes to Miami. The other thing is you have to remember at the time, I mean, there was a lot of controversy around Florida State because they were trying to petition uh, the college football playoff committee yep. for not getting in. I don't think yep. Cam Ward wanted to be involved in all of that. So. And I'm surprised DJ, actually DJ is irrelevant. That's probably why it didn't make a <laughs> difference. But it was a quote-unquote present from Jordan Travis that said he um, talked to DJU to bring him to Florida State. But I'm like, why? why? I don't even get... 
why that happens because like you know you're hearing all these headlines of florida state wants cam ward and i was i was all for it because cam ward at washington state i was like man i wish this guy was on a better team like he is so good and electrifying and now you have cam ward with i mean his he has now a true wide receiver one a xavier restrepo he has a true wide receiver 100%. one it's a true backfield with chris johnson like miami is stacked and that and their defense has always been good and they've always been amazing in recruiting. Their only mm-hmm. issue has been Mario Cristobal play calls and then just putting it together, getting the quarterbacks. They've been struggling with Tyler Van Dyke. So now that you put oh, yeah. Cam Ward in that offense, like I'm excited to see it. A hundred percent. And you know what? Uh, the one main point that they hit on this year too, uh, you said that their recruiting's always good, but now they finally hit on that transfer portals. They were able to bring in Xavier Restrepo and Cam Ward, but man, oh man, that's, it's just going to be a scary duo this year. I think, honestly, I think Xavier Restrepo, I think he's one of the most underrated receivers in college football, and frankly, I think he's one of the best receivers in college football. Like, I could definitely see him being a top three receiver in college football this year. It's a hot take. It's a hot take, yeah. I know. But I can see it. And now, Restrepo was great at Miami last year, though. Like, even with Tyler. Yeah. And so now, with as for the defense, there's a lot of potential and hope. But the thing is, is that it's just really an unproven defense right now. But uh, we'll have to see how they do. But And then as for my prediction for the game, honestly... Both defenses are equally probably just as good right now. It's just the thing is Cam Ward is such a dog and that Miami Florida defense is right away from the get-go is just going to be a really good squad. So, and Florida, I just can't. Graham Burtz is just such a, such a check down merchant. He's such a bad quarterback. Like, he's so it's not even I'm not trying to flame him but like it's not even funny how bad he is I remember watching him at Wisconsin last year he's just so pathetic he gets carried by his receivers every year I mean he had a good season last year though don't get me wrong 20 touchdowns but you look at his stats before with Wisconsin 10 touchdowns 11 interceptions 19 touchdowns 10 interceptions but he cut those interceptions down a lot last year and uh his yards per attempt turned to 8.1 so yeah his season last year was all right but still we got to see a lot more for me to say that Florida's going to have a good offense so I think it's going to be a shootout to start with but I could definitely see Miami winning this game like 41 to like 20 or something I'm going this one right here. This this is probably the most interesting. I'm not going to get to watch a lot of this, unfortunately, but I think this is the most interesting game of the night. But I'm going Notre Dame because AM without I mean Evan Stewart transferring to Oregon. Um they they lost their they lost their quarterback from last season to the transfer portal. He went to Carolina. Both the brothers, both the Johnson brothers uh went to Carolina. So I don't know. Um Honestly, I, I don't know a lot about Texas A&M this season. I'm going to be completely honest. And I, I know a lot more about Notre Dame than a and I know Notre Dame is, on paper, a lot better team. So that makes me lean towards Notre Dame. I know the game's at Kyle Field, which is one of the most, the most hostile environments in all of college football. But when you have a team that is this good so well, I, I feel – their pre- their preparation for week one you get a uh, like a, a sort of like i like to say veteran quarterback you get you bring in riley leonard from duke who is known for playing these big and delivering in these big type of games he delivered against clemson last year nearly delivered against notre dame last year i i that was an amazing game nearly beat oh, notre dame yeah, last that year was, too. that was great and then we ended up injuring him yeah, so and I mean he got hurt against he even dude, even Duke played well at Florida State until Riley Leonard got hurt again. So yes, that does 100%. scare me. He is a little bit injury prone, at least from last season, a little bit injury prone, but when healthy, Riley Leonard delivers. So I gotta go Notre Dame. Yeah, I mean I mean that Texas AM D line is just scary, but the one thing is if you're hitting that play like a champion sign, 
uh, and you're and you're part of that squad, you know you are part of one of the best offensive lines in the nation by default every single year. So as good as that Texas A&M D line is, they're gonna have to go against just a historically probably the greatest, probably the historically the best offensive university for the off or the best university for the offensive line position group. But I mean, it's gonna be a fun one, but. Honestly, I'm gonna have to be taking a lot of deep breaths during that game. It's gonna it's gonna nervous me because as good as Notre Dame's gonna be this year, especially with Riley Leonard, God, am I so excited to see him and Jaden Greathouse, who's an absolute dog. Uh, it's oh, Texas A&M is a good. It's just, they're just a really good team this year, and they're gonna be scary and they're gonna be contenders in the SEC. I mean, obviously you got your top four with Georgia, Bama, uh, Texas, and uh, Ole Miss, but Texas A&M is going to be a scary squad. But the thing that scares me the most is that it's at Kyle Field, which may, that, that's that's what makes it a tough game. If it was in South Bend, if we got to see the touchdown Jesus statue every single play, uh, Notre Dame is winning that game by 40, but it's going to be a close one, but... I still got my fighting Irish pulling out. I I think they're going to be able to win because at the end of the day, Notre Dame's just the better football squad regardless of where they play. So, And Notre Dame's a scary team this year. Watch out for them. They could be a team that potentially goes undefeated. And, and one more one more game I want to look at before we're going to do a week one edition that we'll record later on in the week, talk, going into more depth of every single game uh, for week one. But one more game I want to just look at as you looked at these few key matchups is actually a Sunday night game, which is a great Sunday night game that's going to be in Vegas with USC and LSU. Two schools with their quarterbacks being drafted number one and number two overall in the latest uh, NFL draft. So I'm very mm -hmm. curious to see the post life of Caleb Williams and Jaden Daniels at these two schools. And they both face off in a primetime matchup. I'm very uh, curious to see how this goes. Okay. Uh, do you want to start off? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess so. I still think LSU is going to win this game. I, I think USC was, I mean, it's not even a thing. I know USC was carried by Caleb Williams his, during his tenure there. And when yeah. Tulane, when Tulane beat Caleb Williams, I was so happy just being <laughs> an American conference team as ECU. I was so happy to see that win. I made it feel like ECU beat USC. It's the same thing, basically. Point is, oh my God. They didn't even make the AAC championship USC. that year. They didn't even make the AAC championship that year. They they will will they will make it this year. And they'll win it this year. Bookmark it right here uh at three uh 38 12. Yep. Bookmark didn't they lose it. to FAU last year? They beat FAU last oh, year. Oh, they did. That's the only American conference team they beat last year. How many wins did they have two? They had two yeah. wins, right? Gardner yep. Webb and FAU. <laughs> yup, yup. <laughs> I mean, I'll right. say, say four, but if you wanna if you wanna give your Okay. All right. Well, it's this simple. USC, their defense is still extremely non-existent. And that D-line is going to get whoever is facing up against Will Campbell. Call your mother. Call your brother. Call your sister because you're going to be in for a long one. You need those prayers. Like, call call, call God himself. Do, do like two times the extra prayers that you do in a day because you need them against Will Campbell. And the other part is, I mean... It's just so interesting because both of these teams just have redshirt juniors who were just sitting behind two phenomenal quarterbacks. We're like, and they're two white guys. Like, whoa, he's pretty good. <laughs> two dual threat guys who are now one and two and already are getting praise as probably the two best court quarterbacks in the draft. And both looked like stars in the preseason. Uh, no glaze, but yeah. So for as for Garrett Newsomir and Miller. Mo Miller Moss, uh, I, <laughs> gotta love Miller Moss. He's such a vibe, especially in that bowl game when he balled out. But either way, the thing is, I mean, I personally just don't like USC. I mean, I don't have anything against Miller Moss. I just don't like the school, obviously, because I'm a Notre Dame fan. But uh, at the end of the day, seriously, because LSU doesn't have a good defense either, it just comes down between who's the better 
a redshirt junior quarterback between Miller Moss and Garrett Newsomir uh, for who's going to win that game, honestly. And in all Brian seriousness. Kelly is the better coach over Lincoln. I oh, said yeah, it. that too. That too. Two, two absolutely bona fide washed co- coaches. <laughs> <laughs> I still take Brian as, Kelly over Lincoln Riley, even though Lincoln Riley is a fighter as they used, As not as good as they used to be. They're still solid, but are now just carried by their quarterbacks now. Uh, whoever they get, uh, it, yeah. But I don't think Lincoln Riley and Brian Kelly have as much, has a, have as much of an impact, though, in this game as um, Miller Moss and, and uh, Garrett Newsomir do. Where's this game being played again? I know it's not being played it's in— It's being uh, played in Vegas at the Raiders yeah, Stadium. I was going to say, because it's not being played in Baton Rouge. Yeah, uh, so, okay, I'm, so I'm, I'm interested in to see how it goes. That will, yeah, that'll be fun. That, I mean, those are two teams that are all about the spotlight. I mean, you got the get the gat, get the gat with LSU, and then you got USC, who's Hollywood, so in Vegas. But yeah, it's gonna be a fun environment. But I think it'll just, honestly, I, I just don't, I don't want to call it a shootout, shootout, because I don't know how good these quarterbacks are yet. But I think it'll be a, it'll be the closest game of the week. I'll say that though. Well, then that's going to wrap it up for this first ever episode of Sports Talk with Chris. We're going to be out back later this week for the week one edition of college football. We also have more college football games that are going to be on here alongside NFL games, Panthers on Sundays, and we're going to find primetime games to post on here as well. So thank you so much. I'm Chris Verma alongside Marcus Trevetti, and we'll see you all in the next episode.